Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lesson where we are going to talk about how the conflict between England and the colonies was similar to that as between parents and children. And in order to do that, our essential question is going to be, how was the conflict between England and the colonies similar to that between parents and children? So go ahead and write that essential question across the top of your Cornell notes. And you're also going to make a T-chart in your notes. So as we discuss this, on one side you will have the parents, and on the other side you will have the children. So for example, on the left you're going to have the parent, and in this case England would be similar to the parent. And on the right you're going to have the children, and in this case the 13 colonies would be similar to the children. So. I'll go ahead and pause now and give you a chance to write that down, and then we'll begin our conversation. Very first thing you need to understand about a parent is a parent spends a lot of time and money taking care of the child. From the time the child is born until the time the child is old enough to walk out of the house and be independent, and usually for some time after that, the parent is constantly in caretaking mode. That's something you really need to understand about the role of a parent. And from the point of view of the British, they were in the caretaking mode over the colonies. Um, parents tend to think the child is old enough to start paying its own way before the child thinks that they're old enough to start paying their own way. So there's a tension there. Usually around about the time you get your driver's license, you start having those conversations with your parents about yeah, well, we'll help you get your license, but we're going to need you to help pay the insurance. Uh, in this case, the English are like, well, you know, we fought the French-Indian War, but we need you to help us pay for it. So parents always have trouble seeing their children as equals. Even as they're older, even as they're adults, when you've changed a child's diapers, it's hard to talk to them when they're in their 20s and see them as anything other than the child whose diapers you used to change. We'd like to say that's not the case, but we have really have to fight with ourselves to, to get over that notion that the person that we're talking to is actually an adult, does have views of their own that deserve to be respected and need to be listened to. Um, some parents are good at that, some are not. In the case of the British, not so much. Uh, parents resent not being appreciated for all the hard work they've done. Around about the time you get to the age you're at, your parents have done a lot of work just to get you there. Um, and when you get to the age you're at, you don't usually want to spend a lot of time thinking about all the work that your parents have done to get you there because you are trying to differentiate yourself from your parents. You are trying to be separate and distinct from your parents. So your interests and your parents' interests are not the same, and that leads to conflict. On the other hand, what is the perspective of the child? In this case, the child is analogous to or similar to the 13 colonies. Um, the child has never had to be responsible for defending itself. The parent has always taken care of that. So the child just assumes, hey, that's your job. You're going to do it. You do it well, and I don't have to pay for it or take care of it. Um, thank you, but just keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, the child is not used to paying its own way, so at the point when a parent says to the child, it's time for you to pay your own way, um, that doesn't feel so good, and the child's not quite sure what to do about it. It's, it's, uh, it's an awkward moment. The child definitely wants to have a say in the rules they have to follow. Around right? about the time you're in middle school, you don't want rules imposed on you. You want to actually have a conversation and feel like you're shown some respect as to what your interests are, what matters to you, what you need, and your parents need you to actually listen and say, okay, I'm going to try and hear you, but this is what I need, and I am the parent, so I am going to get what I need. That's just the way it rolls, folks. Um, the child definitely wants to be treated with more respect the older they get. And again, I have a feeling as I say this, I am preaching to the choir. And I, I'm hoping that I am, because if you can connect these feelings and these emotions to what I'm talking about, 
you can get a sense of what the tension was between the British and the colonies. And the child also wants to start making its own decisions and taking care of themselves. They just don't want to pay for it. I didn't say that. Um, so, you know, kids want to be more independent and take care of themselves. Um, and the parents like, yeah, well, if you want to take care of yourself, you can pay for it. And therein lies the rub, ladies and gentlemen. So let's take these dynamics and let's apply them to the dynamics between the British and the 13 colonies. And at this point, I'm going to change the slide. So we're going to have a left side question, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to have another T-chart. Why were there reasons for tension between the colonies and the British? On the left, we're going to talk about the British or the English. We're going to use the terms English and British interchangeably here. Uh, the English went into debt after the French Indian War. When you go into debt, you need to find ways to pay off that debt. They wanted the colonists for pay for their own defense. So basically from the point of view of the British, we paid for the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War was done to defend you. We need you to help us pay for it. From a certain point of view, that's completely reasonable. Uh, the British also wanted to avoid problems with the natives. So after winning the French and Indian War, the British knew the natives were upset because they had sided with the French. The French lost, therefore most of the natives lost. And so there were some raw feelings and the British wanted to let those raw feelings simmer down before settlers started moving west across the mountains from the original 13 colonies. And the British also felt the colonists needed to be kept under control. As you assert more independence, your parents become uncomfortable with that. They try to control you more. There's a tension there. It doesn't always end well. So now let's talk about the colonies. The colonies had had a lot of time and distance that made them different from the English. At this point, we're talking the mid 1700s. The colonies had been around for over 150 years. 150 years is many different generations of people. You're talking at least your grandparents were the ones who originally moved there, if not your great grandparents. So over time, that sense of connection between the colonies and the British grew thinner and thinner and thinner. Also, the colonies were reaching a point where they wanted control over their own affairs. They didn't want someone 3,000 miles away across an ocean in a far distant land telling them how to run their business. Uh, the longer time went on, the less that made sense. They also really wanted to move across those mountains. The whole point of the French and Indian War from their perspective was clearing out the French so the British colonists could move in and claim the land. Never mind the Native Americans. That was their attitude. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's what the attitude was. And the colonists resented the influence of a country that was far, far away that they felt really didn't understand them. So if you've ever said to your parents, you don't understand me, ding, 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 that was the colonies and what they said to the British. Final slide. What was the breaking point? I'll let you write that down. The Townsend Acts, the Tea Act, the Stamp Act, and the English attitudes inflamed the colonists. Um, the English were like a tone-deaf parent. They were not a good parent. They were not a parent that was trying to be attuned to their children. They were a parent that this just, was just like, you need to listen to me and I don't care what you say or what you think. Uh, and that doesn't always go well. The Intolerable Acts, which were designed to punish the colonists for the Boston Tea Party, um, added insult to injury. It's when your parents say, I'm grounding you for six months. And that seems so long and so harsh and so unreasonable that all you really want to do is rebel. Smart leaders influenced public opinion. Um, it just so happens that in the colonies, they had really good leaders and the British really did not. And so the colonists were able to outsmart the British on many different occasions. Because the British had poor leaders, they made poor decisions and therefore made things worse. 
Kind of like when your parent makes a bad decision, it makes the tension between you and them that much worse. And then, of course, there was Lexington and Concord, where the colonists drew blood against the British, and it was no longer a war of words. It was a war of bullets, and there was blood in the streets on both sides. Pretty much once Lexington and Concord happened, um, the colonists were going to have to put up or shut up. And, you know, if you bloody your parents' nose, you know, they have to do something about that. So, really, it was past the point of no return. And if you understand all of this through the lens of parents and children, maybe you'll understand the American Revolution just a little bit better, ladies and gentlemen. But you know if this is the last slide, you know what's coming next. I'm going to tell you to write a three to five sentence summary at the bottom of your T-charts and notes. And keep all of this in mind as we approach the American Revolution final unit assessment. Um, how were the dynamics between the British and the colonists similar to that between a parent and a child. If you really understand that, you will really understand the American Revolution. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Blumendahl once again, face to face, signing off until next time on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube.